it's over. I'm gonna make sure we're recording. We are recording. Uh, again, welcome uh, to this briefing number three by the Restoration Industry Association. We're so glad that folks have been able to participate at such a high level in these briefings. Uh, we have had thousands of views of the first briefings that have been up in this time of unusual crisis that we face, uh, not only as a nation, but also as an industry. My name is Mark Springer. I'm the president-elect of the Restoration, Association, Restoration Industry Association. I live in Bozeman, Montana. Um, if you want to put a comment in the Q&A or chat, um, I'd like to know if anyone had a colder morning than me. I had uh, 10 degrees and two feet of snow this morning. Uh, wow. Greg, Greg, I'm guessing that in Alabama, you did not have two feet uh, of snow. Uh, I'm going all uh, in here. No, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's sunny and about uh, 60 degrees right now. Uh, excellent. All right, so uh, much different scenario for uh, Mr. Crabtree. Uh, my business in Montana uh, actually operates across the state of Montana. We have six locations and about a, a 130 uh, relatively uh, concerned folks who are part of our team up here in Montana. Uh, so uh, pleased to be able to have such a distinguished panel today. Uh, for uh, this industry briefing. Uh, I'm gonna just give a brief introduction before we jump right into our content, which will be very relevant to restorers. Our first panelist is Mr. Greg Crabtree. Um, I'm a little starstruck that Mr. Crabtree uh, was willing to join us today. I've been a big fan of his for years now. I found out first about him from one of my absolute favorite business books called Scaling Up. Uh, I think a lot of people in the restoration industry are familiar with Scaling Up, written by Vern Harnish, which I, I called just the gateway drug of, of business uh, books there, and Greg was a contributor for that. And his book, uh, which we'll be referencing uh, just in a minute, uh, was certainly an excellent resource from a financial perspective for restorers. Greg has uh, over 40 years of experience as a CPA. He's a leading CPA. Uh, in uh, the United States and abroad, and uh, a well-distinguished and renowned author. Uh, next, we have Rich Salerno. Rich is the CEO of Aramsco. Aramsco uh, has seen uh, very expansive growth across the United States and Canada since Rich took over as the CEO. His background is in private equity, and uh, I believe about over 70 locations now in North America. Is that right, Rich? Um, uh, that is correct, yes. All right. Thank you. Yep, excellent. And he, he's going to be speaking to us about managing your supply chain in crisis. I think restores, uh, I'm getting restores and uh, not just restores, but friends of mine uh, in the business sector across the country calling me and saying, Springer, where do we find N95 dust masks? Where do we find disinfect? I mean, that's a real pinch right now for a lot of the supply chain of restorers who need critically more than ever the materials and equipment that we use to uh, protect and restore uh, properties and buildings. Uh, third, we have someone who, of course, needs no introduction to restorers, the restoration lawyer, Mr. Ed Cross, who also is the Restoration Industry Association uh, restoration advocate. Um, he has been on the front lines of the Advocacy and Government Affairs uh, Committee, which has uh, been working on behalf of restorers uh, around the world, really. And he is going to be speaking about managing legal exposure in crisis. Uh, many of the things that Ed will be able to talk to us today are extremely important for all of our industry right now. And then last but not least, we have Mr. Brandon Burton uh, from Next Gear Solutions. Brandon also is the distinguished chairman of the IICRC Standards Committee. Uh, Brandon has been very busy and uh, we have been so uh, pleased and delighted to collaborate between RIA and IICRC on bringing very important documents to the industry on very short notice. I would go so far, Brandon can talk more about this, but I would say unprecedented collaboration, uh, which is in, in my view, one of the silver linings we have experienced in the industry in this difficult time. Excellent to see how folks are working together in these challenging times. 
Uh, we're going to jump right in. I'm going to try to talk as little as possible so you can hear from the real experts on this panel. Uh, and we're going to start with Mr. Crabtree. Greg, again, thank you for joining us. Um, you have a very unique vantage point in what you deal with small businesses right now um, as these businesses face crisis. And crisis uh, has such a disruptive impact. Uh, especially for small businesses. Almost everyone on this call is a small business. Many of them are going to be uh, companies of less than 50 employees. So what? Uh, my first question to you is, what do you consider to be really the most important steps for companies to be taking to manage this crisis right now? I think probably you would say most people shouldn't be delaying taking decisive action. So what is that decisive action? What should people be doing right now to manage this crisis from a financial perspective? Well, you know, that's something we've been talking a good bit about <clears throat> with clients. I've been doing a bunch of webinars and, and getting people, you know, some information. Uh, one resource I would say is if you just go to the simplenumbers.me website, there's a link on the front page that links you to a crisis management download page, mm -hmm. which has a couple of videos uh, that uh, will kind of go through more of what I'm talking about today. Also, some some teaching on templates to use that, that I'll be referencing as I'm talking about this. So really, the, the, the first main thing <clears throat> to have to deal with is really you're trying to understand that now more than ever, cash flow is dramatically different than what you're dealing with in terms of profitability. So, you know, step one is you got to determine what kind of a loss or, or impact you're going to have. But more importantly than that, you got to look at cash flow. And, and that's the biggest challenge that entrepreneurs have really struggled with over the years is, is they, they get confused between the two. And, and, and so our techniques and abilities to measure and manage those things, you know, really are a challenge. And so I created some simple templates uh, you know, it, I call them simple. I mean, some people will still struggle with them because everybody's kind of afraid of that, that thing called the balance sheet. Mm. But to calculate cash flow, you've got to understand your balance sheet. And in my, my book, new book that'll be coming out hopefully within about one to two months, uh, that has kind of been a little bit delayed because of this, but it, it's really trying to find a way for people to understand what we call trade capital. So just think of working capital as uh, take working capital, the traditional current assets, current liabilities, but exclude cash and debt. So that what leaves you that's left over, as you were talking about, is accounts receivable from customers, inventory that you might have to carry on hand, minus uh, accounts payable support from vendors, minus deferred revenue where I might get to bill in advance on things. What happens in a crisis is where we had seen in the last 10 years a significant streamlining of trade capital flow between businesses. We had seen the, the best capital structure ever in U.S. small business in the last 10 years start to emerge, which allowed less capital to be deployed and more profits to be made. What that creates is a higher return on invested capital. And so in the new book, I really talk about this concept of using return on invested capital to establish targeting of profitability more precisely than my original book. I just gave some you know, generic numbers that works for about 70% of the businesses, but more complex business models, you got to think a little more next level. Mm. And, and so what happens in this crisis is this stretching of terms. My AR mm. goes up, my AP, and I, I got to pay my vendors faster because they're hurting and they're struggling. I don't get the bill advance on things. And so this is really why you've got to take the extra bit of effort. And if you don't have an innate ability, use one of those templates. And I gave four case study examples of a manufacturer, a service business, a restaurant, and a sales business as examples of the most dramatic one, which is going to probably be pretty close to your industry, is a manufacturing business. And so in that case study that I go through on, on the download site, I show that we expected them to have a $500,000 loss down from an $800,000 normal profit. So that was, that was the impact that we were expecting them to be shut down through June and then restart in July. Mm -hmm. The reality though was their cash flow loss was 800,000. So if they had applied for uh, either the PPP loan or the EIDL loan, they would, and applied for the loss that they expected, they would have underfunded their loss by 300,000. And so that that's the part that I'm trying to get people to be a little more, you know, you know tuned into and have a way to calculate. And, and the question is, this is a little bit of a shot in the dark. 
but I'm expecting those elongated terms to last through 2020 and mm -hmm. then gradually return to normal in 21. And I think that's probably the planning scenario that we're using in most of our modeling, you know, at this mm -hmm. point. Yeah. So here, here'd be a question I'd have for you. I mean, internally, um, we have ramped up our communication with our leadership team in my organization to really laser focus on accounts receivable because we believe, you know, we have an interesting yeah. business. Um, insurance companies are often funding the receivables yeah. that we have before they get to the policyholder, the property owner. And of course, we're seeing adjusters aren't calling people back right now. People can't get a hold of adjusters, right? And so this right. puts incredible cash flow constraints on businesses. And and you know, restoration right. companies is always a challenge. So if you were running a company that was you know offering the sort of services that that we do, how would you communicate with your leadership team? And what priorities would you put in front of them? Based on, I know I'm kind of asking you a tough question. You don't mm -hmm. totally understand yeah. our industry, but oh, what yeah. would that yeah. rhythm look? How often would you be doing that? What kind of maybe more critical way would you address this? I mean, a lot of people, I, I talk to restoration companies a lot, and they, they look at their accounts receivable once a month and try to get yeah. it to move. But, uh, man, we, we've totally drastically changed a lot of stuff. So how would you address that? Well, I, I actually have a have a planning session with a client next week that, that is a restoration business here in Huntsville. Uh, even though our clients are mostly spread all over the U.S. and Canada, mm -hmm. I mean, actually, this is a case where you know he, he and I have been chatting. You know, we're doing a planning session, you know, for him, and and he's he's feeling okay, but he knows that things are going to stretch. Mm -hmm. I learned this back in the '90s from going to the plant tour at Springfield Remanufacturing. Uh, where Jack Stack created the, or popularized the process of open book management. And essentially, they, they taught me the power of weekly reforecasting. Mm. And so a lot of that is really the service that we provide to our consulting clients is we built forecasting models that continually are appended with actual information as you close and then you reforecast the future. In stable times, you only probably need to reforecast once a month. Times like these, I'm reforecasting every week. I know more this week than I knew last week. Yeah. And, and even though you have a fairly reliable source of payment for the services that you're providing in the insurance company, it goes back to this trade capital concept I was talking about. The days from starting a project to finishing a project will expand probably by anywhere from 50 to 100 percent in terms of length of days. Right. It is that issue that affects your cash flow. Mm -hmm. Now, you are you're in a better position than most to fund that cash flow potentially with, with um, you know, lines of credit and those things. And at this point, we've not seen any indication from the banks to to pull lines of credit. But. If you're a restoration business going into this that had zero cash on your balance sheet, you are using your line of credit to its maximum capacity, you're going to be challenged because the math is working against you in this moment. Now, all of our clients who followed my philosophies of two months of operating expenses in cash, zero draw on the line of credit, this is why you needed the cash. This is why you need an open line of credit that hadn't been drawn on. Now's the time. That's, that's why it's there. And so I get to use, you know, I was using the 2008 crisis, you know, for the last 10 years, you know, to, to convince people of that. Now I have a new crisis to say, see, this is what I was telling you about. Because you know, our clients who follow that principle, they're not in a state of panic. They're absolutely concerned, but they can get through that. So as we've said, if your business was challenged going into this, you have to double down and increase the speed in which you're going to fix those issues and get the backbone to do it and do it right. Because if you're broken going into this, you're going to be hard to be broken coming out of it. And so, but, but. It's not to say that, that you don't have hope. It's just get serious and do all those things. It, I, people have been emailing me that didn't follow what we said, and they said, thank you for telling me that. I didn't do it, but I'm now going to do it yeah. And if I get out of this. And it's like, well, okay, well, let's be on the other side of this next time we have this issue. Yeah, no kidding. So you had mentioned that you've got some simple worksheets that folks can get for free. Can you tell yeah. us again what that uh, web address is where folks yeah. can get that? Uh, I think that's helpful. Yeah, I go to simplenumbers.me and there's a link on the facing page and there's a, a list of, there's a couple of uh, videos to go over how to use it. There's the case studies that I talk about in the video. There's the templates to use to use it for yourself. There's also a special chapter, a draft, 
uh, out of the new book, chapter five, which talks about matching your capital structure to your business model. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the, one of the core things that I think you'll start to understand this concept of trade capital mm -hmm. instead of a flawed concept of working capital that we've mm -hmm. unfortunately used for years, centuries in the accounting world that it, right. it, I've, I finally discovered, hey, th this, this is why this has always bothered me. It's just not a good number. Hmm. Interesting. So I, I'll really look forward to getting that book because I'm, I'm kind of, you know, the, the guy that loves that, those sort of things. I've got a picture up here of the book that um, yep. was really impactful that I had read. And by the way, for anyone who's listening, Greg uh, was scheduled to be one of our keynotes for the Restoration Industry Association convention that unfortunately had to get pushed back to September. Uh, we're hoping you'll be able to be with us in September and the, the new yep. dates that we've got, which we'll be getting as soon as we can get the sure. properties locked yeah. down. But one thing that I, I think would be interesting too, to talk yeah. just for a minute before we jump into care, and I'm gonna pull up a poll yeah that I started here, I'm gonna launch a poll because, and I want everyone who's watching, if you can fill out this poll, it would be super helpful. We, um, it, you need to know this poll is anonymous, so no one's gonna know which category you're filling out. Greg, one of the things I loved about your, you talked about businesses that are getting a 5% net income being on life support. And unfortunately in our industry, uh, we have this uh, really, really warped sense of what uh, profit we should be getting. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a thing called 10 and 10, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand the relationship between uh, profit uh, as far as markup and margin. Mm -hmm. So they get this 10% right. markup, which really doesn't get them a margin of 10%. But a lot of uh, companies are getting uh, profit margins of less than 5%. Folks, if you fill out that poll, we would really be under, this could be very, very important uh, just for us to gather data while we're here. I don't think anyone's voted yet, but please vote uh, in the mm -hmm. poll here. No one's going to know what you filled out here, so don't worry about that. Greg, why do you think, and we've got to be mm -hmm. pretty brief, why do you think that yeah. 10% is absolutely essential as a net income number. Well, I will tell you, I mean, like I said, it, 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 in your industry, I would think that that number is going to be pretty close, but here's actually the reason why. So if you go read chapter five, that draft copy on the download page, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. So we call this CPR, the cash power ratio. If you look at your profit as a percentage to revenue compared to your trade capital as a percentage to annual revenue, you're going to start to understand that when my profit percentage is equal to or higher than my trade capital percentage, I have the infinite ability to grow cash flow free. If my profit percentage is below my trade capital percentage, I have to find a funding source and have to, if I use debt, I got to do what I call base camp growth. I've got to grow until I run out of resources, pause, at, at least for two to three cash flow cycles, let the cash catch up and then turn on growth again. Well, you tell me, is it easy to turn growth on and off? No, no, it's not. Yeah. But as, and this is, this is what we call, we refer to the Hawthorne principle, which is the principle that anything you focus on is, will change just by merely knowing about it and focusing on it. Is once we've shown that to our clients, they've developed more backbone to push profitability up to where it could be. Hmm. They've, drawn, they've, they've grown more backbone to go to their customers and their vendors to get, get their trade capital percentages down. And so when those two things normalize and even get profitability slightly ahead of trade capital, you have a powerful business at that point because mm -hmm. it is all about execution for growth, not finding funds for growth to just be bigger and be less profitable. And, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you, we, we run so many models of people who've gone through the growth cycle just to have more activity and less profit. And it's like, why did you do that? That, that just makes no sense. Interesting. So uh, I know some people are uh, right now posting and saying that they can't see the poll. You'll need to click on the poll there, folks, uh, up in the, if you look at your little dialogue button, we've had a few folks who voted, but not a lot. Greg, we're going to run out of time in just a minute here. Sure. And thank you for joining us. Could you talk a little bit about the CARE Act? Uh, we've got about yep. three minutes here. What sure. do folks need to know about this? How do they uh, go about uh, determining if their business uh, is a good yeah. fit for them? Yeah, so, so right now, the, uh, you know, so go through the analysis, and so here's the prescription. First and foremost, you're going to apply for the, the PPP loan to the extent that you can. What we've been given guidance in the last 24 hours from the lenders, we originally thought that 1099 contractors would count the wage base 
Now they're saying that it's just going to be wages and any of your 1099 contractors will have to apply on their own and their application window opens a week from tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So businesses uh, will apply based on their wage structure today. So get the maximum amount of the PPP. And then as you go, as you see the, uh, the case studies that I do on the website, it says now once you still have a deficit or if you do, you're going to look at the economic injury disaster loan or the EIDL. There was some confusion that you can't have both and you, you can have both. They just can't be applying for the same losses to support them. So mm -hmm. our, our prescription has been know what your PPP amount is first, mm -hmm. then do your cash flow forecast and see if you still need to supplement with an EIDL mm -hmm. uh, in, in that. And so once you go through, through those things, your industry is probably going to be okay. As my client here in Huntsville said, he, he said, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of disaster is going on. There's going to be house fires. There's going to be water damage mm -hmm. that keeps going. And, and he's exactly right. But you will of impact from a cash flow basis because of the elongation of terms. And that's what you got to prepare for. Absolutely. And that's what I think we're seeing across the board. I, industry, I've always said, some people have described our industry as recession proof. I, I think that's a bit of a misnomer. I think it's probably has some levels of recession resistance in it. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. people, you know, one of the things that we're going to have to be very serious about as an industry is to recognize that there will be some impact. I mean, we're already seeing claims uh, frequency mm -hmm. down a bit because people are in their homes and, and they're able to catch yep. things quicker, you know, um, and yep. that might be worried about having someone in their home. So definitely uh, an impact I think people have to be uh, aware of. Uh, Greg, thank you again for joining us here today on short notice. Uh, I know we have a very uh, useful and, and exciting uh, session where you actually take people through some exercises we can look forward to this fall. So again, thank you for yeah. that. And folks, make sure you go to, again, it's simplenumbers.me. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That is correct. Yeah. Excellent. One last thing I will tell you, and, and, and you mentioned, you kind of touched on this earlier, but I, I would put people's focus on it too, is your industry is uniquely focused for a new opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's a significant demand. One of our commercial cleaning clients up in Iowa, you know, he was telling us about the increased demand for his ability to create a clean workplace. Right. And so you guys are, you know, don't lose sight of the fact that, you know, some of the classic cleaning companies just aren't, they don't understand electrostatic sprayers and disinfectant mm -hmm. spray and, and those kind of things. And so you guys have a unique opportunity in special circumstances to go in and be that cleanliness provider in, in places where they're going to have to live with a, a disinfected environment for quite mm -hmm. some time and their original contractor is not going to be able to handle that. Well, if the CPA thing doesn't work out for you, um, considering you already know about electrostatic sprayers, um, well, we, we have a job for you, Greg. Thank you. Again for, <laughs> Good deal. Uh, All right. Being Appreciate here it. All right. And look forward to seeing you again. Speaking of electrostatic sprayers, we're going to jump over to Rich, uh, Rich Salerno, CEO of Aramsco. Rich, we can't find electrostatic sprayers, uh, and it's your fault. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I hope everyone here on the call understands that I have a dry sense of humor. Uh, thank you for being know. here today, uh, Rich. It's, it's really uh, helpful and useful because I think your vantage point is, is a lot different than Restores. You guys are right in the middle of that supply chain. So we're having a hard time finding the critical items, disinfectant, electrostatic sprayers, PPE, N95 masks, pappers, the whole nine yards. Uh, what can we expect to see uh, if you put have your, your Ramsco crystal ball here, what can we expect to see? How's this gonna change? How are you forecasting this? Yeah, let me walk you through what we're seeing now and what, what, we, what we think we'll see over the next several weeks and months. And I'll caveat it, Mark, I, you know, like everyone else, we're, we're going through untested times and mm -hmm. you know, what we're doing today is going to be different tomorrow. That, that, that's, that, that's the only thing I'm certain of. Uh, so I don't want to create any false promises, but we'll do our best to give the industry some visibility into what's going on in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And I think the best way to, to think about it is to split up the categories of products that you're referencing into PPE, disinfectants, and what I'll call applicators. Applicators would be electrostatic sprayers, foggers, uh, other ways of getting disinfectants um, in, into the environment and onto surfaces. PPE is experiencing unprecedented demand. There's obviously, you know, that's not news. That's, that's literally being talked about in, in every broadcast and national media that you hear about. 
it is particularly the case with the N95 respirator, mm -hmm. as well as, as products like nitrile gloves that are used in a medical setting. And domestic manufacturers are experiencing tremendous pressure from the federal government, in, including the threat of invocation of the Defense Production Act in an effort to get them to funnel those products to mm. um, and healthcare agencies as a first priority. Mm. The N95 respirators, we do have product that's scheduled to come in, but I would, ex I would advise everyone in the industry that N95 respirators are going to be difficult to get, I would guess, for the next 30 days. Mm. Um, it, it's difficult to know for sure what happens after 30 days, but what I can tell you is there is an enormous amount of resources at the manufacturer level going into producing N95 respirators. And I think we're going to find ourselves astonished at how quickly the manufacturing community responds to, mm. to the need. Interesting. Now, there are availab availability of, of opportunities for professionals in the restoration industry who are working in a healthcare environment or who are working for a government whether it be getting called in to disinfect a subway or go in to provide disinfecting services or applying disinfectants, I should say, to in a hospital environment, mm. work with your distributor. They will work with the manufacturers of those respiratory products. And there may be ways for those distributors and those manufacturers to work with the restorer to get into more of a priority status for production as it becomes available for the manufacturers. Because again, the priority is healthcare and government. And your ability to demonstrate that you're working in that environment will put your distributor partner in a better position to work with manufacturers to try to get your product. But, but unfortunately, there will be no magic um, bullet as it relates to N95 availability in the next couple of weeks. Outside of N95s, there, the shortage is a, is a function of all of the manufacturers focusing their production efforts on N95s. So the other respiratory products that, that are typically used by restoration professionals in our industry, if there is a shortage there, it is nowhere near to the extent that exists for N95s, but more and more of the manufacturers and the exporters are all shifting production to medical N95 production and they're backburnering their production of, of other forms of respiratory protection. Mm -hmm. So that can correct itself first, but, but it is having sort of a secondary um, there's a secondary issue in terms of supply chain strain, given where people are focusing their efforts. Outside of respiratory, we are expecting regular shipments of suits and other forms of PPE that are, that are currently in high demand. Um, those should be coming in on a regular basis, but they share some of the same raw materials as N95 respirators. So as a result, you're starting to see some strain on the supply chain for suits. And it's not only that they share common materials with N95 respirators, they share common materials with the gowns that you see the hospital professionals using, and there is obviously an emphasis to shift production. Mm. But our manufacturers have been committing to us. We are receiving container loads of product on a regular basis. And then what you're seeing in the industry is similar to the toilet paper effect. You get your shipment of, of product in on a Tuesday, it wasn't there for a couple of days, so people tend to buy a little bit more than what they need, and that can obviously cause an exas exasperation of the demand effect. And it's mm -hmm. difficult in our industry for distributors and manufacturers to use trad traditional methods of allocation with a restoration professional, mm -hmm. because as you know, Mark, you might work on a job tomorrow where you need to put 300 guys on the job, right. and then next Week you may be working a job or next month with 20 guys in the job. So it's not like the distribution and the manufacturers can look at your historical buying patterns mm. and allocate to you accordingly. So I, I think that kind of speaks to what you'll see in suits. They'll come in in batches. They, are, they will be available. They're not going to go through the same strain that you see on N95 respirators, but it is going to be a period for probably a month, month and a half, I would guess, mm. where there's going to be difficulty around suits in the supply chain. Mm. Um, Disinfectants, we are getting regular shipments of disinfectants from all of the major disinfectant brands that we all know and love in our industry. Those manufacturers are moving heaven and earth to produce mm -hmm. at levels that they've never produced at before. As of now, if there are outages, they tend to be measured in days. 
big batch of disinfectants comes in, the distributor sells to their customers and they need to wait a few days until their next batch comes in. There may be some, some outages on the most popular products and, and most distributors like us, we're calling our customers and saying, hey, the disinfectant you normally used came in and it was on back order and went out, but we just got in a shipment of some other product that is well known in the industry, is on all the relevant EPA lists. And most restorers are saying, well, in that circumstance, I need it. I'll switch to right. the product that's available and I'll get the disinfectant. I need to do the job. Mm-hmm. So again, they experience some outages, especially I think we're going to see that. You're going to see that you may have to wait a few days or go to an alternative brand for another couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. If we start to reopen the economy, and at some point, I believe we will and we'll have to, my guess is you're actually going to see a surge at that point in demand for disinfectants because mm-hmm. all these folks be going back to work, back to school. There are going to be opportunities, as as Craig mentioned earlier, that you might need to do cleanup in a school or an environment, or you could be providing a new service to your customers. So I do expect disinfectants will be in high demand. Hmm. Um, And there will be periods of outage, but I don't think you're going to see the same kind of pressure there that you're seeing with N95s. In Hmm. terms of applicators, electrostatic sprayers and foggers are niche devices that historically were sort of made in small quantities and consumed in small quantities. And now that they're moving off the shelves as fast as they're available. Right. We are actively looking at other modes of, of application. In fact, I think we're launching some pieces today on a sprayer that is typically used by painters that we think could have application for applying disinfectants. So there are applicators out there, but there are, there are going to be, they're not going to be, you're not going to be able to call up your average distributor and order 200 electrostatic sprayers and expect to get them on a moment's notice. Um, I can tell you that the distributors in general, the manufacturers are working very hard mm-hmm. to secure as much of the supply chain as they can for mm-hmm. our industry. As yeah. I said, we've spoken with the manufacturers of PPE at the highest levels, and we've effectively educated them on the fact that our restoration professionals are going out there and they are actually first responders in the battle against COVID-19. And any documentation the industry can provide us about the good work they're doing for governments and healthcare organizations will put us in a better position mm-hmm. to get those individual contractors goods, but also kind of raise and elevate the awareness of what the restoration industry is doing. So certifying mm-hmm. and writing that I'm working on a hospital, empowering us and, and, our, and our brothers and sisters in the distribution community with that, with that documentation can put us in a better position to secure product and to meet your mm-hmm. needs. I'll pause there, Mark, and, and see. No, that's a lots of lots of really good information. Well, I've got one last comment. There's been some uh, comments coming in in chat. And just so everyone knows, we are going to be addressing the issues of PPE and the longevity of PPE. I think, you know, historically, you know, we don't use, in my company, we don't use that many N95 dust masks, but we do use a lot of P100 uh, cartridges for our respirators. And, you know, historically, we would dispose those pretty quickly, especially when working in fungal you know, environments that have fungal contamination, because the size of those contaminants are so much larger than these viruses. So one thing I know that we've been doing is, is stretching those further. Um, I don't know if, if you could talk just very briefly about some alternatives to N95s that you guys are experiencing. Maybe may more of a technical question than what you're typically dealing with, Rich, but if you have any comments on alternatives there, I think that would be uh, really uh, useful information. Yeah, it's that, that's going to be the way we're going to find a way as an industry to get through this, protect our people, and do good work for our communities, mm-hmm. is looking at all alternative options. So as you said, whether it be P100s, N95s, any form of respiratory protection that is available at the manufacturing level, we are procuring it and securing it for our customers. Mm. Um, there's, going to be, there's going to be challenges there because again, the entire world is trying to get respiratory protection. Right. As it relates to suits, the manufacturers are shifting their production down to the most popular sizes, the large, extra large 2X and, and maybe even 3X suits. There's a lot of various levels of protection that various um, contractors use in our industry. Mm. And there are going to be options to switch out of one product to the next, which may allow all of us to extend um, the, the availability to protect ourselves as long as possible. Disinfectants. No question that there are brands that, you know, you've grown to love and you stick with your preferred brand, but in circumstances where you run out of that disinfectant, being able to procure an alternative. In terms of the 
longevity of, of PPE and how long you can use it. I, you know, I would defer to manufacturers yeah. um, instructions in that. But, but as you pointed out, Mark, that, you know, people are adapting and they're finding ways to, to, to do right. what they need to do to protect their people yeah. and keep everyone. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Rich, again, thank you for joining us in here. We might have some questions by the end of this time, so I might swing back to you, uh, but thanks for availing yourself as I know you're a very, very busy man right now. And Mark, one other question that you brought up that was it, one of the things people should be aware of on pricing. Most of the reputable distributors are working really hard to protect and preserve pricing okay. as it stood at historical levels and to this, yeah. to, to this date, largely have been able to do that. Um, so, I have not seen any of the major distributors in the industry or any of the major manufacturers seeking to, to, to yeah. change pricing. Yeah. So this, I think they're working to the opposite. There may be in the coming months, some raw material shortages on things like nitrile gloves where the raw material producers start to start to push through some price increases. That's something that we're monitoring closely. Okay. Excellent information. Rich, thank you again. I'm going to jump right over to, uh, our friend and restoration advocate, Mr. Cross. Mr. Cross, uh, there are some things that restorers are doing that is, uh, there are some exposures that they have that are not the typical exposure that they have in a pipe break water restoration job. Uh, talk to us about some of the things that you're seeing and some of your chief concerns that you see with your 30 years of restoration experience. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here for putting this on. I think RIA is doing a fantastic job and I wanna start uh, by extending my condolences and sympathy to everybody out there who's been impacted by this virus. I see the numbers and it's, it's really frightening. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanna make uh, one side comment really quickly, which is I think that the media is not putting enough attention on the necessity for restoration and disinfection services and, and our government leaders uh, some of them, I think, are guilty of the same thing. They're putting the focus on being reactive rather than proactive. Mm -hmm. And the people who are on this conference today, you're on the front lines of helping to mitigate this problem and, and, and really save lives now more than ever. So my hat is off to you, uh, those of you who are courage, courageous enough to uh, jump into this kind of work. Mm -hmm. In terms of the legal issues, it is really vast and it's really complex. I'm going to touch on a few points Today, I've been doing some private webinars for some groups. If you want a deeper dive into it, uh, go ahead and let me know. I'd be happy to, to help you out with that. Um, the threshold issue I, I like to start with is whether or not, in simple terms, if you have liability insurance coverage that will help you uh, in the event that you have a claim that relates to viruses. There are three different kinds of policies in my mind for, for ease of discussion for thinking about on this. Number one, uh, policies that explicitly exclude viruses, number two, policies that are silent on viruses, and number three, policies that explicitly provide coverage for viruses. That's what you refer to as an affirmative grant of coverage. Um, I don't think enough restorers are understanding that they may not be insured on this. I got a question the other day which says, my policy is silent on viruses, does that mean that I have coverage? Well, you might have coverage or you might not have coverage. And so what I hope that everybody will do is uh, get with your insurance broker if you haven't already and, and send an email so you have everything in writing asking whether or not you have coverage for the different types of claims that can uh, result from this. If you are renewing your liability insurance policy, be sure that you disclose the potential for virus claims there. And these policies, the, the applications have different boxes to check for the type of work that you're doing. I had a client who just checked a box that said water damage restoration and assumed that would be sufficient. It's not going to be sufficient. Keep in mm -hmm. mind that the insurance company has to understand that you may have the potential for coronavirus related claim against you. And if you're not disclosing that in the application, they can't use it in the underwriting process and they may use that as grounds to uh, deny coverage. Mm -hmm. In terms of getting your contracts uh, put together, I think it's very important about the terminology that you use and the way that you describe your work and that you're not biting off more than you can chew. If you pull a standard traditional work authorization off the shelf and it says you're going to return the property to its pre-loss condition, are you going to be able to come up with some sort of evidence 
that you return the property to its pre-loss condition. So as an alternative, what I recommend when I'm drafting contracts on this is that we are selling a process and we're not selling a result. It's like a, a pest control company. They're gonna come out and apply product. They're not guaranteeing that they're gonna get all of the pests. Um, lastly, on this point, I highly recommend that people get together with a, a qualified environmental consultant for internal reasons to go over the protocols and the different procedures and products that you plan to use. So you've got some assurance. So you could say, hey, I, I consulted with an independent accountable expert on this mm -hmm. about the techniques that we're using and we found them to be reliable. And, and it was a reasonable judgment call that we made at that time to use this particular procedure. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I, one question I have people call me about, Ed, is they just say, hey, I want to do COVID work and I want to guarantee that I'm not going to get sued. How, how do you do that? How do you guarantee that you don't get sued? On a well, COVID? you can't guarantee that you, you can't get sued. The courthouse is really? at five o'clock. And if somebody wants to file a paper against you, they can. The name of the game here is to mitigate potential claims and to reduce the possibility uh, and the chances that somebody's going to file a claim in the first place. Uh, I always say that the number one assurance for this type of thing is to have good public relations and good relations with your customers. Uh, in normal circumstances, happy customers don't file lawsuits. These are not normal circumstances here, but, but having a good working relationship with a customer so that uh, they understand they can contact you if there's a problem or a concern and you come out and and try to uh, mitigate that as best you can. Secondly, obviously, is really, really good training, staying on top of your work and providing first-class workmanship. And lastly, is having some good protections that are, uh, that are in your contract where you have managed and you have, you have uh, limited your liability without setting it up so that the customers don't have any rights at all. Mm. So speaking of the contracts, Ed, one thing that is, of course, critical in any contract is defining the scope of work, right? Right. So this is a new challenge for restores, okay? Because historically, we define the scope of work a lot of times as our estimate that we have generated in a pricing system that we're all really used to, that has all these line items that typically we're very, very used to. Uh, this work is different. In fact, uh, there was just a uh, email sent out to uh, from a major uh, pricing platform addressing this issue a couple of hours, maybe an hour before this call. And 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 really, one of the things that was defined in that email is that a lot of this stuff isn't there. So, how do you speak when you speak with your clients about defining the scope of work? Is there any advice that you're giving them uh, as you walk through that piece of the contract, which is of course so critical? Yeah. So you really want to be careful that you're not over committing, as I uh, alluded to a little while ago. And I, I highly recommend that when you're working with your environmental consultant, uh, you come up with an accurate description for your work that you can actually defend. And you should, you should have something in each of your project files, which is evidence to show that the description of work that's in your contract is something that you can perform and something that's likely to be effective. And, and when I say effective, it doesn't mean we're eradicating all of the virus. Frankly, I don't think that's a realistic expectation in this. Right. Instead, I think it's better to set up the contract where it says that the contractor is going to uh, provide uh, good uh, workmanlike service in a good faith effort to try to mitigate the risk of the, the transmission of the virus. Uh, with the understanding that there's limitations to the science, there's limitations to the cleaning and disinfection technology. The customer understands those and accepts those, but is paying for the value of the service, which mm -hmm. is something that's done in a good faith effort to, to mm -hmm. control this problem. Make sure you've got some evidence that you actually did the work. It's very different from like a mold remediation project. You can take a picture of a wall that has mold on it, remove the mold, and take another picture of the wall to show it doesn't have mold on it. Well, the virus is not like that. You can't see mm. it, touch it, smell it, mm. photograph it. Right now, you can't even test for it. But if you've got some, some video, for example, of the work being done, some of the guys I'm talking to are considering using body cams 
this mm -hmm. sort of thing. You say, hey, look, this is us doing the work like a pest control operator could do without any guarantee that it's going to get the virus completely out. Wow, interrupting. So folks, you can, if you have questions, there is a Q&A box. I know people are still having a hard time finding the poll. We've only had a few people fall, fill out the poll. It can be found uh, on the Zoom we uh, webinar toolbar. Uh, feel free to enter some questions there. Um, Ed, I'm going to just uh, put in a small uh, plug. This is not an RIA service, but of course, Ed has a uh, private law firm in Southern California. And Ed, you've made a contract available to restoration contractors uh, for this specific circumstance. Uh, I know for, for me, I was delighted to see that because if I were going to hire my attorney here in Montana, as you're not licensed in Montana, unfortunately, but I hope someday you are, um, it would have cost me many, many times more to do that. Uh, folks can go find that. It, I believe it's at edcross.com. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And if somebody would like a deeper dive into these legal issues and you have a group that would benefit uh, from a webinar, go ahead and let me know. My email address is edcross at edcross.com. It's very interesting to me. I really enjoy discussing these subjects and the work that you guys are doing is so important. I hope you, mm -hmm. you forge on. It's not going to be perfect, but, but please carry on. Yeah, excellent. Ed, we have, uh, so much appreciate uh, all that you do for anyone listening in here. Um, Ed is, is someone who has, uh, as I already indicated earlier, been on the front lines of the advocacy and government affairs effort that has continued to gain momentum and gain ste uh, steam in this difficult time. It's, it's difficult right now because so much of our energy is focused on this COVID crisis and a lot of things had to just permanently get the pause button pushed on. Um, but but thank you for all you do for stores everywhere and uh, we look forward I know we'll be talking with you more uh, in the weeks and months to come uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, last in our uh, briefing today we have mr. Brandon Burton Brandon thank you for being with us from Washington State I believe is that correct Brandon Yep, Washington State. Washington State, of course, which was one of the early epicenters of the COVID crisis that we're in. Brandon uh, is someone that I've had a pleasure to interact with and have a relationship with now for multiple decades, I think at least 20 years, um, which was, I think the first time I met you, I was actually in high school, uh, Brandon, 25 <laughs> years ago. So back when I was slave labor in the company I work for. Uh, so, uh, Brandon now is the uh, Chair of Standards for the IICRC. Uh, Brandon, we've had a chance to work together through this crisis on now two occasions um, between IICRC and RIA, uh, something I am so thankful for. It's something that I, I wish we could have been doing for a long time. It hasn't. This crisis has forged uh, some of that. Some of that started two years or last year when we uh, initiated the agreement between RIA and ICRC. Could you talk a little bit about how that's been working? We released in the last briefing the first document. We have a new document now that I'm going to uh, scroll over to while you're talking. Um, but talk a little bit about that process and uh, why that document is important. Yeah, let me start with the process and, and echo your comments, Mark, about the collaboration that is occurring between the Restoration Industry Association and the IICRC. Um, both of these organizations are really critical elements to our industry um, that serve similar but, but different purposes. And uh, it, it's been amazing to, uh, to observe uh, very directly in the role that I serve uh, the collaboration that has occurred between these two organizations as we've gone through this pandemic uh, and taken what was initiated, as you referenced, uh, about 12 or 18 months ago, um, that was kind of an initial foot step forward in these organizations working together, um, which could not have happened at a more opportune time, mm -hmm. and set the foundation for us to very rapidly collaborate on the reports that have since been published. Um, it's, it was amazing to watch that from the inside. And I, I watch it from a, a very uh, specific vantage point, you know, being the standards chairman for the IICRC standards documents. Um, I typically observe information like this be developed and collaborated upon and published over months and years in duration. 
Um, and what the RIA and the IICRC were able to do with both of the documents that have been published in collaboration is, is to reduce that down to a measure of days and weeks, um, which is in, in my experience with this industry has never occurred. Um, not for something in collaboration, maybe an article written for you know a, a particular magazine or something like that, but not a peer-reviewed paper uh, mm -hmm. that contains the type of content that these do. Um, so to move to the, the second part of that, Mark, the document that was published more, more recently here, uh, the second document was published on March 23rd, um, and it specifically deals with the process of sustaining emergency service operations uh, given all of the, the challenges that the coronavirus or COVID-19 has placed upon our globe and more specifically upon our industry. Uh, we heard a, a lot of that as, as Rich uh, went through his discussion and the supply chain side of things and the challenges legally that Ed discussed uh, that we have to consider from a liability standpoint and, and just the change of the scope uh, of what we're embracing as our, our, our new reality, our, our, new, our new normal. So this document takes an effort at providing information to the restoration community at large on how we sustain those operations in, in, these, in these new normals. Um, and it breaks the information down into a few different buckets. It talks about, you know, how, how do you go about the prioritization of your work, you know, first and foremost, right, to, to be, uh, you know, a good, a good citizen, to be a good member of your community and really honor and uphold the social distancing and, and the other things that governments and, and health agencies are trying to instill in us as a community to slow the spread of, of coronavirus. You know, how, how do we look at our business and look at that from that state of responsibility and how we reduce, you know, the potential transmission that we risk by continuing to operate. Um, secondarily, it then gets into performing an assessment specifically on your staff. You know, it, it's not normal for a restoration business to have to look at their labor force and their staff, you know, with the lens of understanding that there, there are different levels of risk, you know, depending upon the individual that is on their staff. Um, you know, the last thing that you want to do is take somebody that is in a high risk category and put them into a high risk project, right? Because the, the potential outcome, if there, there was an exposure there, is much greater. Uh, so an assessment needs to be done on the staff itself and understanding, you know, what roles and, and, and types of activities should we put certain individuals into. Uh, and that's, uh, that's all based on the very fluid and moving and changing information available from the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, Canada Health, you know, a number of different organizations globally uh, that are providing information on this. And then last but not least, you know, once you finish that assessment of both your work and your staff, then we need to talk about the emergency service work that you're going to continue to provide. So how do we protect for the workers that are going out into the field? Um, how do we protect for those that they'll be interacting with in the field? Um, and, and in that area, the recommendations are broken into a couple of subcategories. You know, what are the things that need to be done all of the time, right? Just the new normal. Right. Uh, so you're going into any property to perform emergency service because of a water damage, a fire damage or, or whatever other peril has occurred. You know, what needs to occur regardless of, of what area you live in and what we know about the occupancy of the space and the risk that they've had of exposure themselves. Uh, and then what are the supplemental steps that you would take if there is any indication of an elevated risk as it relates to COVID-19? Um, a couple of things that I want to mention about about the the suggestions that are in this document. First and foremost, uh, it is critical to understand that this information is constantly changing, right? Mm -hmm. What we knew, I'll just give you a great case in point, what we knew about the risk uh, of, of exposure and a vector just from aerosols uh, and the transmission of the virus because of aerosols has changed dramatically in the last several weeks. Uh, we had a case that became national news uh, just right here in my, my neck of the woods in Washington State. In fact, the same county I live in where a choir uh, held a rehearsal in early March uh, and there were approximately 80 attendees that were rehearsing in this choir. None of them were symptomatic. Right? Nobody was showing any signs uh, of coughing, sneezing, fever, any of these things. They took precautions and spaced out all of the individuals from the choir. Uh, no hugging, no, no personal contact. Well, 45 of the individuals that attended that rehearsal ended up contracting COVID-19. Mm. Uh, two of them have since died, right? Oh. 
Um, and, and the only vector of transmission that really could have instigated that, that makes any logical sense, would have been through aerosols, not from coughing, not from sneezing, but from literally singing. Hmm. Uh, so, so the information related to this is, is changing, it's developing, it's moving. And as it does, so will the recommendations and documents like this. So there is an active group of individuals that are reviewing this content, uh, not only on this document, but the previous document that you referenced, Mark, Yep. where the IRAA and the IICRC are collaborating. And as these reports are updated, um, then they will again be made available to the industry. Uh, the, the information in them is going to shift based on a number of inputs, right? Those inputs are going to include things like, uh, what do we now know about uh, the coronavirus or COVID-19 that we didn't before? What are the health agencies and governments sharing with the general public, with the, 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 the business world at large? Uh, what is essential, what isn't essential, the availability of certain supplies and equipment. Mm -hmm. These are all going to be factors that are that are loaded up into those changes. Yeah, there's um, really a lot of moving information and I think it's so important that we stay on top of this live. I know on the Restoration Industry Association, which is restorationindustry.org, uh, folks can access both of those documents uh, under the resources tab, go down to COVID-19. You can access both documents that have been uh, referred to. Uh, both these documents are very important. Um, one I described, the RIA document that started, I referred to as an external document. This IACRC uh, primarily document with RIA uh, peer review as more of an internal document. Would that be a fair assessment, Brandon? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So the two, the two really marry up nicely. We're going to have a session that I'm going to talk about in just a minute that will be facilitated by RIA's uh, education chair, Josh Miller, um, here in a couple of weeks to talk more in depth about the differences between the documents and really get more down into, you know, as folks like to call it the weeds uh, with us. But uh, Brandon, thanks for that high level uh, briefing. I think that's uh, really helpful. And again, we continue to look forward to the collaboration that we can enjoy between our two organizations and uh, the direction that we're going. Folks, I'm gonna pull up some of the questions uh, so we can answer a few of those live. Of course, a lot of folks have had trouble with the uh, finding the Zoom toolbar. I think the only way you can get the toolbar and access the poll is if you have logged in on a computer or maybe a tablet. I don't believe that that um, is available on the phone if you've called in on the phone. So apologies for that, but it is in the toolbar. I know a lot of people made comments about that. Another uh, question, and Rich, you may know something about this. It looks like from Steve Lowry, uh, our friend out in Virginia, Virginia Beach, said, heard there is a shortage of one gallon containers and we should keep empties and order 50 gallon drums. Real quick, Rich, uh, can you confirm that or do you know anything about that? It is true that some of the disinfectant manufacturers have have been delayed in receiving their containers, which is causing some of the gaps in, in availability of disinfectants. They, they've been able to kind of change their sourcing, change the packaging size of their containers um, in order to get product coming in on a somewhat regular basis. So mm -hmm. there is some truth. In terms of change, saving 55 gallon drums and containers for recycling and reuse, I have not heard a call from the manufacturers for that. Um, but I, I can certainly, I can certainly look into it. But it's not something the manufacturers have reached out to us and said, "Hey, can we have your customers return their containers?" That that mm. they're working in pretty controlled environments. So at this mm. point, they're securing materials. But I, but I can certainly yeah. dig into it. Well, it seems like I know for us, we're buying stuff in 55 gallon drums. And it seems if you have one gallon containers, certainly you're not going to be able to haul 55 gallon drums around very effectively. So it's probably a, just a good practice right now to be saving those one gallon um, disinfectant uh, labeled um, containers because uh, they have the label instructions on them, the kill claims and so forth. So probably a, just a good idea. And thanks, uh, Steve, for bringing that to our attention. That's the first time I've heard that. So it's useful information. Um, the rest of the questions, of course, folks, I'm sorry about the poll that I, I didn't know that it only shows up if you've logged in on a computer. Uh, we did get um, a few answers on the poll. Uh, only 12 out of 100 people who were on the call today were able to answer. Um, uh, it looks like about 50% of uh, the folks who answered are in the 5 to 10% net income range. 
uh, there, uh, only one that was less than five. I know a lot of our scores reported an unusually good year last year. So that might have some of the impact that we've seen. And then uh, to that uh, perspective, uh, a good sized portion of the group that answered, again, not a very legitimate sample size here, but uh, five of the 100 folks uh, said that they had greater than 10%. So kudos to the folks who were able to have the operational efficiency to be at that level. Certainly that is a much more sustainable number. As we wrap up here, I wanna uh, just let folks know that these industry briefings will be held every two weeks. Uh, we will be endeavoring uh, from the Restoration Industry Association to be keeping the industry abreast of this kind of information as quickly as we can. Again, special thank you to Greg Crabtree, Rich Salerno, Ed Cross, and Brandon Burton for being on here today. Appreciate all of you gentlemen, your commitment to the restoration industry and helping us get through this difficult time. A couple last updates here as we wrap up. The uh, industry uh, association trade show, which was scheduled to be held uh, here in just two weeks. And New Orleans uh, it has had to be pushed back because of, of the issue that we're facing. Uh, we are working to finalize dates likely in September. Uh, we know that it will not be in New Orleans as we feel it would be entirely too risky to be in Hurricane Alley in storm season. Uh, so we are working as well on a new venue. We should be able to announce that to everyone uh, very quickly. In the meantime, uh, we will be hosting a virtual conference. Anyone who has already paid to be a part of the conference in New Orleans, which we had very, very strong registration for, will be able to at no charge attend RA's very first virtual conference. This is a four hour conference on April 16th. Make sure and mark your calendars. The content that we have for this is outstanding. I already referenced Josh Miller will be hosting a session to explore in greater depth some of the granular details of these documents that have been released. We're going to have sessions on PPE management, which is, of course, critical in this uh, environment that we have, uh, as long as a lot of other sessions and a report uh, with RIA's town hall on the progress that's being made with the advocacy and government affairs, uh, the RIA new board of directors, as well as some of the strategic direction that RIA is moving into. All of that information will be available in the virtual conference. If you aren't signed up and you want to still attend, if you are not signed up for our in-person conference in New Orleans, uh, there will be a cost of only $99 to attend this uh, but I would highly recommend you just register for the conference and then you get it for free. Uh, with that being said, again, folks, thank you for being here today. Uh, be strong. Again, I said this before, leadership from the restoration industry right now is paramount. As leaders, you have to be intentional with your communication and the precision of your communication. So I encourage everyone to do that. Uh, be well, stay strong. We're going to make it through this. Uh, we will see you in two weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.